Perfect. So welcome, everybody. I'm Bruce Calder. I'm the VP of Consulting Services here. And for my sins, I'm a senior scientist. So I'm going to talk about the substance restrictions in 2024. I'm primarily talking about articles, physical products, and I'm going to talk about either substance restrictions that go into effect in 2024, or they're really early 2025, and you really need to get the work done in 2024 to meet the deadline. I'm primarily going to talk about restrictions, like thou shall not have type stuff. But I will talk a little bit of reporting, some because some of the, the requirements, like microplastics, have a restriction and a reporting requirement. But also the U.S. federal PFAS reporting, which is reporting only, not restriction. Um, but it's it's so topical right now, and it's only been out for a week. I might as well blather on about it somewhat. Uh, I'll talk about pull-down menus and the most exciting things you could think of. So I'm going to talk about first about something that you don't have to do next week, and it's a bit confusing. And there is a formula issue related to Excel with the official exemptions control sheet from the EU Commission. And I'm going to explain that. Then I'm going to talk about uh, POP restrictions, PFHXS, and then the historical PFOA one a little bit. And then the implementation of POP, such as we understand in China, because basically, more or less, depending if you believe it extends the articles or not, which is up for some debate, but basically almost word for word, almost, the EU pop restrictions are in place in China as of March of this year, 2023. Um, their exemptions are almost word for word the same, except for where they're not. They're generally slightly more permissive than the EU, so if you meet the EU requirements, you're pretty good for China. Um, Reach, I'm gonna talk about the longer versions of PFOA restrictions. I'm going to talk about microplastics, I'm going to talk about formaldehyde restriction, dechlorine plus, such that it is, and MCCP restrictions. And then I'm going to talk on the U.S. side, Tosca, don't forget about the phosphate of flame retardants, banned uh, late in 2024, PIP 3 and 1, 3 to 1, and also PFAS reporting. So it's not a restriction at the end, but it's definitely very topical, and I'm going to talk about how to report for PFAS and all that fun excitement. Definitely when I'm invited over for dinner parties, which I'm not, uh, I talk all about it. Anyways, um, so first of all, thing you don't have to do, but it's very confusing. So the EU Commission still controls ROHS. Someday, quite likely, ROHS will become a regulation, possibly part of the reach, possibly part of the reach regulation, but probably on its own. When it does, it will move the control of all this silliness, exemptions, and such to the European Chemical Agency, uh, which is better outfitted to handle this thing. However, um, so what the problem is right now that hyperlink. Whenever you see, by the way, this bluish purple color with an underline and these slides it's a hyperlink so you can always afterwards when you get the slides click on that get frustrated that it doesn't work uh or it does work and then uh, uh, there's an excel sheet that you download and the problem is you don't actually view it in your browser you have to open it up in excel or google sheets or whichever most excel versions will come up like the middle and it will say hey the exemption 7C1 ends in 2021 or 2024, or exemption 6B ends in, in 2024. And a lot of people are going, oh my goodness, uh, you have to get rid of uh, lead and aluminum because it, it, uh, the, the you know, 6B exemption expires next year. Well, it doesn't. It, they were planning to, but they never got around to publishing it. And the Excel sheet's quite smart about it. It's got a formula that deals with that problem. Unfortunately, the formula doesn't work in a lot of people's version of Excel. And so it looks like it's banned in the top one. You get a little error bar. Um, and Google Sheets open the bottom one and suddenly sees colors, the, the, the um, end dates are all strict through, um, they're not published yet, so all these exemptions, uh, they're in the renewal process, are still valid, probably until they rewrite the ROHS directive into a regulation someday in the far distant future. So um, we, we got about two dozen requests on this last couple of weeks, people like, hey, can you slide aluminum? Well, theoretically, it was going to be, exemptions would be changed in 2024, but they never actually got around to publishing it. And since they didn't publish it, it never became official. So in reality, um, uh, none of those exemptions expire. Though unfortunately, if you have like Excel 13 or something like that, um, it doesn't understand the formula and it makes, looks, makes it look like they did expire. Um, if you use Google Sheets or a really modern version of Excel, the formula functions and it's no longer a problem. So uh, a lot of people get requests like, hey, you can't use 7C1, you can't use 7A, you can't use 6B. Yes, you can. It's just a formula issue, so you just, need to open it in Google Sheets or something or a version of Excel that can handle the form. Um, it's hilarious that this is causing such, this formula issue is such and causing such a problem. So there's something you don't have to do next year other than explain it to people. And explaining it to somebody like a supplier who may not be the same first language yourself is, can be quite exciting. I'm like, 
we're going to have to do this in pictures. <laughs> um, so uh, new restrictions, I'm going to talk about all these things. Now, primarily European. Uh, Europe has more of them, but for the first year in a while, we're going to talk about U.S. restrictions. Or it's, it's quite rare. Um, and, and it's not any exaggeration, whatever. We're in North America and Canada. If a substance is a bioaccumulant, it may get regulated like PIP. Um, but if it's harmful to humans, it generally won't. So if it causes cancer or attention deficit, which is developmental reproductive toxicity, or Alzheimer's, which is called oxidative stress, which doesn't even have, by the way, a GHS category. One of the most ironic things in the world, people talk about, hey, we've got to stop Alzheimer's. Well, maybe, just, just a thought, why don't you create a classification that things that can cause it, we know like dissolved aluminum causes Alzheimer's easily. Um, we work with laboratories that use it all the time to, to induce it in rats. Um, maybe they should have a categorization. If we have reproductive toxicity, we have endocrine disruption, why don't we have oxidative stress or one of the or another term which means the Alzheimer mechanism? Um, but all that kind of stuff is not banned in North America. It's very difficult in Canada and the US to, to prove human harm. So if it affects a human or it causes attention deficit or autism or Alzheimer's, perfectly allowed. If it affects flora and fauna, fishies and puppies and trees, um, then it gets banned. Which is fair enough. If you ever watch a movie and you know, 20 people get gunned down, there's often with you know a witty. Uh, remark people laugh well, a dog gets hurt slightly and people get extraordinarily sad and angry so maybe it just all follows that i don't know i personally would like you know wouldn't it be a bad thing maybe to actually prevent the substance that causes attention deficit the ones that cause alzheimer's that might be good but that's not what we're doing we're affecting bioaccumulants so in the u.s and canada bioaccumulants or persistent organic pollutants are getting regulated and that's the ones at the top here now these substances would also theoretically be regulated in canada but were unnecessarily complicated and can't get around to it. Um, so there's a lot of consultations, which are really not interesting and uh, not regulated here. So, and the upshot is there are products you can buy in the US and Canada that are illegal in China. True story. So your laptop in front of you can have as much lead as it feels like in, in uh, the US or Canada. It can poison you as much as it feels like. China, it can. Now, generally, the laptop guys are a little better up on this sort of thing, and they sell globally, and that won't be a problem anyways um, in their particular case. But your washer and dryer, on the other hand, which are only North American models, they can put as much of that kind of stuff as they feel like it. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is European. Sorry, I wandered down a uh, chemical road there. Um, and then we're going to the U.S. side. So starting in the EU, we're going to talk with POPs, persistent organic pollutants. And generally, persistent organic pollutants are things getting regulated this right now mostly because the UN Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. And we're gonna talk about a chemical that is completely meaningless to ban, but let's go for it. Uh, PFHXS, I'm gonna start with one. Yes, you have to deal with this next year by doing nothing. Um, so PFHXS is a, a, a water-soluble, a sulfonated fluoro salt. It's a per-sulfonate, um, same family as PFOS. Hex means it has six carbon fluorines. Uh, PFOS means eight octa. It's banned as of August of, of uh, suddenly August of this year, which means companies, if they had to worry about this, are really scrambling right now and next year to get rid of it. It's banned at 25 parts per billion. It's also banned at 1,000 parts per billion, anything that grades into it, which there isn't um, pretty well. Now, it doesn't exist in physical products. We've been testing forever. And it's really weird. So this comes from um, science papers and news articles, which definitely a, an inflammatory he headline is helpful and don't for a moment think science papers or, or people who publish them are not that different from the Kardashians. They need the publicity, they need to, to show the interest, they need to show the published papers. Um, they have to fight for funding, um, it's like fighting for clicks. It's actually roughly the same thing in academia. Um, so uh, they have a lot of the same motivations to be sensational. It pays the bills. Um, so one of the things are, if you really wanna find PFOA type chemicals in PFOS and that, you don't go around and just test the drinking water because it's kind of boring, especially now. Now that uh, PFOA is banned and it's pulled out of cosmetics, it's pretty boring to test drinking water for these things. They're pretty clear as a bell. So what you end up doing is you, you go to like the airport and you go to the burn pit where they practice you know, the firefighting things and then you test that soil. And it's gonna be polluted with all the stuff in firefighting foam. And this, by the way, PFHXS is not in physical products. We've tested a zilly and is not in modern firefighting foam. Doesn't nothing else, nothing that we currently find a product degrades into it. 
kind of pointless. Like the way you deal with this product, by the way, from a compliance point of view, is you turn on the TV and just watch something else because it's not in your product. However, and I love great conversations with drinking water people, and we eventually figured out what they're finding. It's related to a firefighting phone from decades ago, not the current one. The current ones are C6 platelomer based, and I'll talk about C6 platelomers later. Um, and these, even though they look like this chemical, don't degrade into it, and I'll explain why later. Um, that's why we don't see it at all. However, there's some old PFOS based firefighting foam, which does degrade into it. Um, it's from a long time ago. There are lots of good science papers on the actual direct testing of those firefighting foam. So if, if a, you know, if they want, if a academic or EPA wants something sensational, you go test the burn pit at a military installation or airport or firefighting center and you'll get oodles of this stuff from, because they're forever chemicals. They're going to still be there, you know, decades later. Um, but it's nothing to do with any of your products today. So the ban is basically none of the horses left the barn, the thing, the horses already had three children, grandchildren just died. Um, so this is not really that important of a restriction. So on the bright side, brand new restriction, you don't have to do a thing about it. Now, fluorosurfactants are used in the sulfonate family and they look a lot like that chemical, but they're not. So firefighting foam uses C6, six carbon fluorines. And that's the six carbon fluorines and they're sulfonated, which this is, but it does, they don't end up being the same thing. Um, also that same, the same surfactant that's used in firefighting foam, more or less, the same family is used to make fluoroelastomers. This is the one fluoro additive we see relatively commonly. It's the C6 photelomer base. I'll explain what that all means. Surfactant used to make Viton FKM or Calrays FFKM, fluoro or perfluoroelastomers. They have one in it. It's a very similar family, but not banned. It's not the same thing. So most surfactants are really complicated chemical in the top left, and there are thousands. And I explain why there are thousands and why it doesn't really matter, because all of them in that family degrade into the one in the bottom right. 6,2-FDS is probably one of the most important, important PFASs to know. If you don't know this one, focus on it. After PFOA, this is the most important um, water-soluble salt to know in the PFAS family. It's ridiculously common. You have fluoroelastomer seals, you have 6,2-FTS. Uh, firefighting foam, 6,2-FTS. Um, it's because there's an incredibly huge family of surfactants, surfactants, thousands of them, that degrade into that guy. And I'll explain why. By the way, it's not regulated right now, which is helpful. The new uh, EU PFAS restriction would, we put in a lot of derogations, like for fluoroelastomer seals, which are super important. If you allow fluoroelastomer seals, you gotta allow this family in it. So. In most surfactants, surfactants like detergents. They have a polar end and a non-polar end. The fluorinated side is the non-polar. The really funky side, the bottom, is the polar side. It's the one that does a lot of the, the, the reaction work. Um, it's a very potent, so in low concentration, it has incredible detergent uh, oil and water mixing capability. So the forever chemical part's the top. And almost every PFAS has a forever chemical portion, but it doesn't mean the whole thing. Most PFAS actually have huge sections of not forever chemical sections. The for, so carbon fluorine is the forever chemical. And fluorine and carbon is, is the bond energy of bond dissociation. The energy it takes to break it apart. Carbon and fluorine is ridiculously high, and very few things actually break it apart. So that's why it's the forever part. The downside is it also doesn't react with much. So there is one thing it reacts a little bit with. You can stick another carbon on it, and so you can stick two carbons in the middle, carbon hydrogens. Those are basically polyethylene. Polyethylene is long lived, but it's technically not forever. And it's the part that allows the forever chemical, the unreactive piece, to attach to something much more exciting. So then you, so you have the six carbon fluorines, your two carbon hydrogens, that's a six, two platelomer, you have a sulfonate, and then you have the exciting things. This is the short half-life exciting bit. And that exciting bit can be many, 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 many different things. So the reason why there are thousands of PFAS. There are also other families. And then you do this at a C6 length and a C8 length. Like you make the carbon fluorine different lengths, you can end up with infinite numbers. But it isn't really. Because the bottom piece is very temporary and it falls off. It's a very reactive piece. And so you end up with the six carbon fluorines, the two carbon hydrogens, and the sulfur, 6,2 FTS. And that's one of the reasons why whatever the families use, we find 6,2 FTS. So it's not like we have to test thousands and thousands of chemicals and try to invent or theorize what other, and most of the, by the way, the chemicals on the top left are confidential, proprietary, good luck figuring out what they are, but they all have 6 2 FDS at the end of the day. It's not a forever chemical technically because the polyethylene in the middle will degrade eventually, but it's an eventually. So we always see it. So when we test Viton, we see 6 2 FDS. 
eventually, slowly, because it's not quite a forever chemical, the middle piece degrades. Um, it oxidizes and it pops off. When the middle piece, the polyethylene piece pops off, it takes the sulfur with it. The sulfur is gone. It's one of the reasons why we don't see PFHXS, because the sulfur is on the other side of those carbon hydrogens and leaves when it leaves. Now, the reaction is a bit more complicated. They'll actually usually change fluorine lengths. So when the middle piece pops off, it creates a bond problem in the last fluorines, and it'll actually change length a tiny bit sometimes. Um, this usually ends up being PFHXA. So once all the, the non-forever chemicals leave, you just have the forever chemicals, carbon and fluorine, and then what's in water? Oxygen, hydrogen. And you get the PFOA family. This one is um, the PFHX sixth length version of the PFOA family, which is not currently banned, might be in the future. If it is, it really, really, really needs a derogation uh, for fluorolastomers. Otherwise, it pretty well bans all fluorolastomers and most of society will collapse. It's the floral astomers handle high temperature, high acidity, high oil, high chemical situations, which is kind of important um, to keep those sealed in. And that material is ridiculously common. You'll even see it in your hard drive. It's so common. Um, so at the end of the day, as much as there are thousands, it's always amusing me, inside physical products, there are, could be thousands that started there. There only are about a half a dozen floral polymers and then about a dozen or 14 maybe um, floral salts of interest. We test about 35 floral salts because you, you get more information of how it got there, um, but all of them degrade into roughly 12 or 14 substances. So instead of having to worry about the gazillion, and I always question how many PFAS do you, do you test for? Like all of them. Well, how do you test all of them? We find the floral polymer and that's the intentionally added one. If you want to know the floral salt, there's only about 14. All of them degrade into 14. And all that matters is they're there because it's like this and things that degrade into it. And that's why the regulations are set up that way. Um, so you don't need like, hey, this, this lab tests for 100. No, we test for all of them. But there are thousands. Yeah, but it doesn't work that way. Which cast numbers do you test for? Oh, God. Next thing you're going to tell me is, is PFAS comes off uh, Teflon cookie pans, which is also completely untrue. Um, I'm like having a test lab for a while and going, you know what? Half the stuff you guys think are absolutely completely wrong. Um, it's amazing. We also, when I search for things in one of the regulations, I find the copy paste wrong statements in the US version, the EU version. I'm like, you guys really should test something yourself sometime. And you would find out that you're relying on data that's not right. Um, so eventually there's a handful of fundamentals. That's one of the reasons why PFHXS isn't, isn't there because it's actually not a degradation path for anything modern. And I'm sure a fire, fire, firefighting foam from a couple decades ago, um, sure, but um, not anymore. So that one you don't have to worry about, this one you do. So I'm gonna talk about the reach pop crossover of PFOA and longer. They're, they're all intended to be in pop, but it's so much easier to get them proved as a reach restriction first that each one like PFOA started as a reach restriction and eventually moves over into pop. The longer versions of PFOA are currently a reach restriction. Someday they'll move over to pop. It really doesn't affect it. So PFOA is currently banned. The longer versions of PFOA are also currently banned. PF, so PFOA is octa, eight. PFNA is an N, nine. Uh, PFDA PF is probably the most common one in humans, um, is 10. PFDA is, is a byproduct of uh, makeup until about 2021. When PFOA was banned, they had to get rid of the ingredient. I'll talk about that later. Um, medical devices banned in 2025 in Europe. So how common is it? Ridiculously common. But they're banned. Mm -hmm. Using data gathering? Yeah, that's not, that's why. So these are never added, by the way. These are all degradations of other things in it. Oh, they're like degradations of Teflon. No, other things. But the ingredients of Teflon, also no. <laughs> so yeah, it's from other things. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but it's very, very common. You're, you're looking at one right now, I'm pretty sure. Your laptop, your tablet, or your phone has it. But you can't because they couldn't sell them in Europe. Uh-huh. Anywho. Um, yeah, I would say it's, it's probably unfair to say, I would say if, if the regulator's knowledge of PFAS was gunpowder, they couldn't blow their, blow their nose, but anywho, um, they'll get better, I'm sure. So it was really, we submitted a whole bunch more data. So what this is, the one data we submitted in EU, I'm like, Hey, where are we finding untested in 2022 and 2023? It's really repetitive. It's pretty obvious. Is it in PTFE? No. They're like, well, that's what that's what all the 
Because everybody's saying, yeah, what, the journalists? Those are guys are, yeah, they become great journalists because their chemistry degrees huh. and their test lab. No, they get, they get the chemistry, they get the journalists get their pay from the headline that attracted your attention and they did their job because that's their job. I'm not saying they did a bad job, it's their job. They, you know, they need clicks, they need people to read, otherwise they go hungry. Um, so PTFE, does it have any of these? No. All these different floral salts? No. Does a radiated PTFE do? Yes. All the time. It has the entire family. So PTFE normally is quite rigid. So if you have your, your fry pan, PTFE, Teflon, and you tap on it, which if you do that for your family, I'm like, what are you doing? You notice it's not very soft. It's pretty hard. PTFE is very rigid. So to make it flexible, they can irradiate it. And irradiate it takes, PTFE is incredibly long polymers, really long. We have thousands of Daltons. That won't be much most, it's not like, you know, it's not like different James Bonds. And that, that kind of dated me there. Um, Timothy Daltons. Um, it's very many Daltons long. And then you gamma radiate it and it breaks up into pieces and these pieces then reconnect in the called cross-linking and a rubberized makes it rubber. However, some of these pieces react with the air and become the PFOA family. So if you irradiate PTFE, which is extraordinarily common in medical devices, I would say about a half is there. Um, your PTFE tape, your plumber's tape, hey, it's kind of rubbery. Yeah, PTFE isn't rubbery. The only way you got that far is the original powder got irradiated, so it was easier to press and extrude like Play-Doh. Um, and it's irradiated. And that's why your plumber state, well, most of the time, not always, most of the time, um, even in medical devices, has all the PFOA family in its band. Expanded PTFE, your Gore-Tex type material, um, it's, it's basically PTFE fibers you've expanded, and the fibers you can blow air through, but the fibers are so hydrophobic, water repellent, that water won't go through. Amazing. To actually be able to take PTFE and spread it out as a fiber, you had to irradiate it pretty well. So they also have PFOA most of the time. Um, PFA, you might go, oh, PFA, I don't know what that is. Uh, chance of your products use lots of it. Medical devices, PFA is everywhere. But right now, you have PFA probably within hand's reach, uh, whether you know or not. It's a variation of PTFE. It's got an extra carbon oxygen carbon bond, and that's not a carbon fluorine bond. It's really weak, and it allows pieces to break off and become PFOA. Um, your laptop or your tablet or your phone. One of the things about these electronics is they get hot, really hot. So PVC wire can't stay, stay in there. It will get destroyed. So also you can't have PVC wire in your stove. You have silicone wire in your stove, but they're thicker. Um, you can't really have that thick of a wire inside your very dense uh, laptop or phone. So what they do is they, they can use Teflon, wires PTFE, which is very heat resistant, but PTFE, as I mentioned before, is pretty darn rigid. And you've got this dense electronic, you can't just wire it. So if you have your laptop here, how are you getting wires from the motherboard or graphics card up into your screen it's through really thin, really flexible, very temperature resistant wires. And that's PFA. So your tablet, your laptop, your phone, most of the time we're using PFA. And generally, because of its the polymer construction, it's full of PFA. People are like, well, that's not allowed in Europe. Yeah. There we are. How's the data gathering work out? Anywho. Um, it's because it's not added to PFA, it's a degradation product, so it doesn't appear in any declaration. You have to test for it. It's the way it is. Um, Fluoroelastomers, they almost always have 6,2 FTS, which is not banned, might be in the future, and have degraded slightly the PFA HXA and actually the HEPTA and, and PENTA versions too, um, which are not currently banned. PFA HXA might be banned in the future. They'll need an exemption or derogation for fluoroelastomers, otherwise we have no society anymore. Uh, those seals are pretty important. Yeah, people are like, hey, look, we don't want gas pipelines to leak. So you pretty well want fluoroelastomers, don't you? Um, but it's lots of other things. Um, fluoroacrylates, um, that's the waterproof coating on your jackets, your winter jackets, your uh, outdoor furniture covers. Um, it has, it's actually acrylic paint with side chain, weakly attached to carbon oxygen, carbon bond, PFOA molecules, they break off and produce tons. So basically all waterproof coatings for fabrics um, have that. So in a really good example, you got a shirt right now and it's going little white tags or black tags made in China or Taiwan or Bangladesh or whichever. Um, they often need that tag to survive a long period of time. So they floral coat it, which is fluoroacrylate, which is PFOA. Hence are you have PFOA in contact with you right now. It's not that bad. It's, a, it's quite powerful surfactant, but it's nowhere near the concentration of your laundry detergent, which you use on those clothing anyways. And laundry detergent, by the way, does the exact same thing, just not in the same concentration range. Uh, fluorosilicone doesn't have it. 
Uh, fluorophosphates, the was until 2021 where the major ingredients in concealer and foundation has tons, probably the largest source in drinking water of the PFOA type family. Um, yeah, so pretty common. You want to, do you have it? Do you have these materials? You have it. It's <laughs> the way it is. It's not like, you know what it says commonly? It says almost never. Does it not have it? Rarely is it degradation type thing. So it's, it's, it, it'll always have 6 FTS in a fluorolastomer. PFHXA is a bit rarer in low concentration because the 6 FTS is not a forever chemical, but it's a pretty long life chemical. So only a tiny bit of it degrades into the next stage. So where do you see it? Dense electronics, you're gonna have PFA, which means you're gonna have the PFOA family most of the time. PFA can be made without it actually, but if it's not controlled that way, then your dense electronics, you have dense electronics, there we go. You have handheld or a dense piece of electronics, you're gonna have PFOA family. Uh, fluid and gas components, PTFE tape has it most of the time. You can make it without it actually. There's a way to do it. Make PTFE tape without the irradiation process and some of the best ones can do it, but unless you're paying the top dollar, uh, you don't have that one. Um, and actually the cheaper stuff that's made with PFOA looks better. Uh, it, it's a little smoother, it's rubbery. Medical devices, tons. I would say 40% of medical devices have it, of, of like medical electronics have it, implantable invasive. Implantables have it all the time because PFA coated electronics is the norm as opposed to the exception. And that will have PFOA most of the time. PTFE tape wrap is used inside wiring all the time. You see this white rubbery wiring that's PFOA based. And PFA wire is really common in medical devices, especially invasive endoscopy, because it has the flexibility and the chemical resistance. Well, PTFE has the chemical resistance, but it's not terribly flexible. You don't want to be stuffing it up somebody's ca uh, catheter, up somebody's artery, and it doesn't like to bend. You just poke right through things. So these PFA, which bends really easily. Um, waterproof fabric, including your made in China tag, often not all the time, but your your winter gloves, your your you know your covering for your table outside, your barbecue or whatever, full of it. That's the way it is. Um, all banned in Europe. There's some expiring exemptions of sorts and medical devices up until 2025. One of the reasons why we had to put in a whole bunch of derogations into the PFAS restriction, because otherwise we don't have most medical electronics in 2025. And if your medical device people relying on supplier declarations. Well, on the bright side, the national authorities don't test much, but you have a lot. We test it all the time. You have tons. Um, important note, by the way, on China. China actually has the EU POP regulation, almost word for word. So almost word for word. It's actually slightly more permissive. For example, um, PFOA is, is banned um, in medical devices, in implantable based medical devices in Europe in 2025. There's no end date in China. So slightly more permissive. Um, it's a little bit confusing whether or not it's just chemicals or articles, but the restrictions, the way they're transplanted suggests that it applies to articles. So basically EU pop in all intents and purposes up until including PFH excess, which it doesn't matter anyways, is in effect in China and it all started March 1st, 2023. There's an interesting argument whether it's physical products or not, uh, but the exemptions suggest heavily that it's physical products too. So if you're compliant to EU pop, you'll be fine in China. Um, but China has basically the word for word identical pop restrictions as the EU. Like even the, 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 the order of the derogations or exemptions is the same. It's almost word for word, there's a link there. Uh, if you click to it when you get the thing, it'll be in Chinese. Um, if you have a modern browser, you can hit uh, the automatic translate, which is so, so effective. If you get the PFOA, the first line is, uh, cannot be used uh, for new production devices. You know, like, okay, we can't use for new products. No, it's actually, you can't make new production equipment to make PFOA. It's a weird one, but then there's a whole bunch of normal ones after that. The translation is very difficult. Um, but in all intents and purposes, EU pop is in effect in China. So don't forget. So anything we're talking about EU, if you combine with EU pop, you'd be fine in China. There is some interesting discussion of whether it does extend to articles because it's not clear. It doesn't say one way or another. However, the exemptions have things like medical devices, implantable, invasive medical devices, which kind of suggested it there. Is. On to you, reach. Now we're going to the reach side, right from pop to reach. By the way, a lot of things that eventually end up in the persistent organic pollutant or pop regulation start in reach because the reach restriction process is a little more set piece. And if you want to ban something, you do it through the reach restriction process, then you kick it over to pop. Just easier from a governmental point of view. So microplastics, they published the ban in the start of October. It bans microplastics in mixtures, not necessarily physical products at 0.01%. It's really mixtures. Uh, the ban for the consumer products, it's banned. Uh, micro abrasive beads 
is banned uh, is is already banned as of yesterday. So we used to have like the soap with like the little plastic bits that rub against you. Yeah, no, banned now. Rinse off products that are not makeup, which I'm not sure what that means. It's October 17th, 2027. Is that like sunscreen? I'm not really sure. Uh, the amusing one in the middle is medical devices, consumer medical device mixtures, which are very few and far between. So maybe when you get the dental implant, the dental implant goo is a medical device, by the way. It's probably, it's consumer because touching a patient. It could have microplastics, probably not, but it could. They're banned in October 17th, 2029. Makeup, including lip and nail polish, uh, it's not banned till October 17th, 2035. You're going to glitter your makeup because, hear me out, the justification is it's so hard to reformulate makeup as opposed to medical devices, which is much easier, it turns out. I don't know who did the lobbying. They don't even have to declare microplastics in makeup until 2031. I can do it from their ingredients listing in like 10 minutes or at least make a good approximation. Um, ah, wonderful lobbying. Uh, I don't know how that, they pulled that off, but it's amazing. It's like, hey, if you can pull off that one, makeup not until 2035, you can make pull off anything. Um, exclusions, uh, professional industrial mixtures are not part of the restrictions, neither is pharma, IVD, fertilizer, food additives, food permanent, and things permanently incorporated into a solid matrix. And solid matrix stuff are pretty well out of declarations too. So it's really around mixtures. Industrial products, mixtures are not banned. So here's an example. You make a glitter paint. One of the main uses of glitter, by the way, is actually in paint for boats. So if you put the glitter paint, glitter in the paint, and you can't sell it to a consumer after like 2027, they can't glitter paint the boat. But you can sell it to a paint shop who can do professional disposal and they, uh, professional, uh, disposal and they could paint the boat. And if you buy a painted boat with the glitter in it, that's fine. It's an article, not a mixture. So uh, they can't sell the glitter paint to you to paint your boat, but they can sell it to a paint shop to paint your boat. And once your boat's painted, it's not a problem. But the paint shop has declaration requirements. So the first the persons selling it have to provide to their customers instruction for disposal, professional only, microplastic statement is a sentence in the legislation saying this contains microplastics, don't do anything stupid, uh, more or less. Um, information on quantity and concentration of microparticles. So basically it's like, hey, it's 5% PTFE microparticles. And the generic information, the identity of the polymer, like PTFE or polyethylene or nylon 12. Um, IVD products. Their mixtures have to need prevention of release instructions for them. And makeup doesn't even have to make a declaration to their customers until 2031. Blows my mind. They could do it next week. It's not next week. And they'd have to redo the labels on their products. But we'll take like next production cycle next year. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, they know exactly which ones are microplastic in their products. So when you declare, if you have to declare, to your customer, I have microplastic in my mixtures because it's a professional mixture and still allowed, not banned. The information shall be provided in the form of clearly visible, legible, and indelible text, either, either you know, floral coded. Indelible text usually means, hey, you have to floral code it. Just that's always an interesting part. Or where appropriate, in the form of pictograms. What kind of pictograms do you have for microplastics? Sure, maybe it's PTFE symbol. Fair enough. The text or pictogram should be placed on the label, the packaging, or these are all ors, by the way, the packaging leaflet of the product containing synthetic polymer. Microverse, or where applicable, you can use safety data sheet. So you, you would just, it's, it's industrial, put it in the data sheet. Makeup in 2031 is going to have to put it on the label. Fine. Everybody else just put it in the data sheet. In addition to the text of our pictograms, oh, what else do we have to do? Suppliers may, wait a second, may, you don't have to do this part, but you can, may provide a digital tool that gives access to an electronic version of that information. I have a feeling a, a previous version said must provide a digital tool and they compromise to may, which means nobody will do it. It's pretty interesting. It's just kind of a waste of tech space. But um, microplastics reporting. So one is declaring to the customer, but if you're selling feedstock like base microparticles in the EU, you have to report to the ECA starting May 31st of 2026. If you're selling mixtures or you're using a mixture, like some, you're, you're actually a boat painter uh, with the microparticles, you have to report to ECA every year starting in 2027. That's the like a reporting. And you have to report what's your end use for each end use, which polymers, micropolymers you're using, estimation of the quantity of synthetic pol polymer microparticles release the particles release the environment, and which derogation exemption allows you to continue to use it. If you're an industrial user, it's it's very simple. Um, but this is what when you start reporting in 2027, if you're you know glitter painting boats or you know a professional use the same thing. 
in a facility you need or using it for a dying agent uh in industrial setting um you have to report starting on may 31st and every year beyond beyond that 2027 the actual people who make the microparticles are 2026 but the actual users are 2027. now what are microplastics that chemical is not by the way so this is a taylor swift um this is our video bejeweled 2022 i'm not really familiar with your music as much one of the neat things about the video though is all the ingredients of our cosmetics were published online so it's great so it's a really good example the concealer she's using is 2022 did not have this chemical because it's basically phased out in 2021 this concealer type not necessarily this brand but this type normally would have had c7 to c15 for alkyl phosphate it's like the chemical down below they easily degrade into pfoa and pfda that weak carbon oxygen phosphorus bond on the far right dissolves in the water so literally if you're using concealer until 2021 it literally bleeds into the water pfoa pfna and pfda so like the the, the news article with the guardian this year that you know pfas linked to infertility in women it wasn't pfas it was pfda in women's blood the women with higher pfda in their blood had lower fertility so basically women with the biomarker of heavy makeup use had lower fertility it's an interesting problem but it's not like your teflon or cooking is causing this problem this is a different chemical um, and pfda is not quite but almost unique to makeup which once pfoa was banned they did punt it like good citizens in about 2021. in 2022 we tried to buy a number of cosmetics with this ingredient and we found them online but by the time they arrived to us the ingredient was gone so it's really successfully phased out we did a um, audit one of the main cosmetics manufacturers a month or two ago not necessarily with their knowledge just for interest and they had it completely phased out um it's it's it, this one's been completely gone but until 2021, it would have been maybe five or 10% of the population uses it on a regular basis. And that would have flooded the water supply, especially drinking water supply. Now it wasn't restricted. I'm not gonna blame them for it. There's no rule they couldn't. And once they couldn't, they stopped doing it. Nowadays, most of this concealer is all silicone rubber based, but concealer is foundation, hair conditioner, your head and shoulders, by the way, your hand moisturizer are primarily silicone rubber based. Um, and they'll use the word dimethicone, which is trying instead of saying I have silicone rubber, they say dimethicone. It's silicone rubber. It's the same material as your spatula. It's a silicone rubber coating. Um, so that's the way most moisturizers and concealers and foundations all work. They're based on silicone rubber. And the more expensive it is, the more silicone rubbers. Like this one has six silicone rubbers they have. And what the silicone rubbers do quite magically is you, you basically cut, you coat yourself in the same silicone rubber as your spatula. And it blocks water. So it's, it's very moisturizing, but it lets air through. And even more importantly, silicone is completely non-resistant to oils. So your oils still come out. So you don't get as acne as much because they're not blocked in because oils go right through it. Silicone is not resistant to oil whatsoever. Like if you take your spatula and put it in the dishwasher, it'll suck up every flavor in that dishwasher when you take it out. Or my little silicone rubber case to my AirPods, um, if I cook Indian anywhere near it, it will smell like Indian food for months because it will suck up all the oils produced during the cooking. And I can still smell it right now, and I haven't cooked Indian for a while. Um, silicone rubber has the incredible ability to uh, allow oils through it, which for a lot of other applications is really bad. So a silicone rubber is generally a very poor replacement for, for floral elastomers. Um, so they're almost all silicone rubber based. Now they won't have PFAS, but they are gonna have trouble with the siloxane restrictions coming in. The building blocks of silicone are starting to be regulated. There's actually more chance right now, a lot of you, your silicone rubber might be regulated sooner than your PTFE. That's not a microplastic. These are rubber coatings. It's different, it's not a microplastic, it's a rubber coating. What do you may think about that? It's a perfectly human safe rubber coating, which may contain D4, D5, D6 bioaccumulants, but it's just a rubber coating, not a microplastic. The setting powder, on the other hand, which I just learned about a couple weeks ago, is the powder that's put on to set it. It has nylon 12 and polymethyl methacrylate particles. Those are, depending on the size, are generally microparticles. It's all a size question. It's nylon and PMMA. PMMA is the building block of contact lenses, little particles of that. You put little particles of that on you, and they're likely microplastics. Better than average chance. Um, not that we tested this for, for microplastics, but those are typical microplastics. It's also what I'm saying. They don't have to declare the ingredients of microplastics until 2031, but it's blatantly obvious, at least to them, if not myself, which ones have microplastics. It's not very hard to do. So these we banned in 2035 because that setting powder, it's really hard to replace the nylon 12 with the PMMA in 12 years. Sure. 
uh, when PFOA was banned, they replaced it within two, and it's a lot harder. Um, so whatever, um, that's the way the rules are. But again, it's a mixture. It's a powder. It's consumer, so therefore it's restricted. In 2035, my kids can worry about that one. Um, uh, but that's microplastics in a mixture. And that's your Taylor Swift dose for today. Unless you get an elevator or a retail store. Um, so reach, the next one I'm going to reach, formaldehyde restriction. Now formaldehyde has been restricted in its emission. So it's not concentrations, how much comes out uh, in wood for some time. So MDF wood, which basically sawdust with glue, that glue is a phenolic formaldehyde. That glue is now regulated in other products. It's all around formaldehyde release inside the vapor barrier of a building with consumer exposure. So there's a whole bunch of things that are excluded, outdoor use, um, professional industrial articles, unless formaldehyde release leads to exposure to the general public under foreseeable conditions of use. So imagine you make a whole bunch of IT equipment and you have servers and switches and stuff in the server room, not general public. You have a router and, I don't know, screen terminal out for the general public to use, that's professional with a general public exposure. So they're in scope. Electronics are definitely in scope. Medical devices are not. They're regulated differently. Neither are pharma, which are medicinal. Textiles and personal protective equipment and food contacting have their own regulations around formaldehyde, as does biocides. Formaldehyde is a biocide, um, and they have their own regulations. So if you have a product that can have consumer exposure, even a professional, inside the barrier of a building, vapor barrier of a building or a house, you're in scope, and you have a maximum 0 0.08 milligrams per meter cube release. Uh, where does formaldehyde in products? A lot of your electronics are actually formaldehyde-based polymers, uh, phenolics. Um, some of your epoxies will be phenolic formaldehyde. Others will be BPA. The BPA one doesn't have it. It's a formaldehyde-based one. Acetyl, which is also called Delrin, its real name is polyformaldehyde. Um, there are quite a few electronics, mostly around the circuit boards. But if you take a music speaker, they have the formaldic formaldehyde, phenolic formaldehydes all over that place. Banned in 2026. Um, so you don't really have to do it in 2024, but you might get started on it. Um, but it, it's it's around products that have really a consumer exposure inside a, a building, excluding medical devices. The MCCP restriction. So this has been planned for some time. It's still not actually restricted. They've all agreed to restrict it. They were going to restrict under ROHS. They agreed to restrict under ROHS. They said, now nah, it's put over in reach. Now they've agreed to restrict under reach. They know pretty well what the restriction is going to be, but they haven't got around to publish it, which is fine. It's a plasticizer aid for phthalates, such as DHP and DINP. They help phthalates and PDC work better. By the way, this the short chain version and the medium short chain version in China's version of POP, which as short chains are banned, short chains are banned in EU and China. In the EU version, they're not allowed in PDC. In the China version, they are. So it's, it's a cheap plasticizing aid for like DINP, which is still allowed in power cables, et cetera. Um, it will often be present with the banned short chain chlorinated paraffins, but it is a risk. Now, when is it actually going to be banned? It's still up in the air. The rule is under the most recent proposal is two years from when it's published, it's banned. Okay. And really complicated to read. And you have a reporting requirement within six months. And it's not at the SPHC 1000 ppm. It's present, which from a testing perspective usually ends up being 100 ppm for this chemical. What does that really mean? So it'll be banned, and medium chain coordinated paraffins is plasticizing aid will be banned two years after entry into force the restriction, and, but there's a report requirement six months after entry into force, so it's earlier. So imagine they publish it and enters into force February of next year, which is a pretty likely time frame. Then the report requirements kick in six months later and you have to report to your customers if you have any MCCPs in August, 2024. And then the restriction itself kicks in February, 2026. Now it is an SVHC, but the reporting require and the ban requirement will be the same as the SVHC. However, the reporting requirement is lower. So if you have any coordinated paraffins, you basically have to report it. And you're looking at primarily cheap, flexible PVC. So it hasn't actually been published yet, but it actually has requirements very likely in 2024. And the Decorum Plus One, they've agreed to do it, but they haven't actually published it. They've also told the Stockholm Convention they're gonna restrict it, but they haven't got to it yet. Restriction will go into place 18 months from entry into force publication of the um, restriction, which hasn't happened yet. So restriction will likely, if they publish it at the end of this year, middle of 2025, which means we're doing most of the work in 2024. It's a flame retardant, less common than is reported in thin plastics, like 
It's a chlorinated flame retardant, but like brominated flame retardants, when the very thin plastic burns, um, it releases excited hydrogen in the air. The burning to chlorine plus has so many chlorines, it releases chlorine in the air. The hydrogen and chlorine react. The excited hydrogen particle is, their energy is damped down a little bit by the chlorine, it becomes HCl, still too much energy and it won't stop the burning. And then they react with antimony from antimony trioxide, which is a much bigger molecule, absorbs the heat energy and stops the burning process Why it's charred. Also likely why um, we had a um, light fixture this week. Um, something went wrong, either damage from a roofing error by someone else and water got into it um, or whichever and it shorted. And you can see where the, the firefighting worked. It uh, burned because a huge sparking, but it didn't flame, so it didn't spread and it didn't drip. So the PTFE and, and the ABS portions were just fine and it didn't drip. Uh, so Decorium Plus is amongst that family. It's a gas phase flame retard, like most of the brominated ones, like tetrabenzophenol A or decabene E, which are brominated. Um, SVHC is 872,470 listings in SCIP database, which most of them are not true. Um, it's not that common. We test for it all the time, it's not that common. Uh, but um, it's one of the problems with the supplier data gathering for SCIP. There's a lot of telephone game, and then there's computers just mass spamming the database. So it's not that meaningful, but it does exist. So it's mostly in heat shrinks. Uh, Decorum Plus is good for polyolefin, which is like heat shrink, as opposed to PVC, which is wiring. PVC uses different uh, flame returns. They normally don't use Decorum Plus. It's mostly polyolefin. So it'll probably be banned around mid-2025. So just give you a heads up, things to work on next year. It is a reach SPHC. So there will be some data um, on it. The data gathering won't be as terrible as this one is as PFOA. Um, th there will be potential gaps in it. It's we're looking at heat shrink, shrink primarily. You know, if you're buying it from an old name brand like TE or something like that, they'll know for sure. But if you're buying whatever the cheapest wire from whoever, anything can happen. Um, now on the US side, so that's Europe. Now on the US side is don't forget about the PIP flame retard, PIP 3 and 1 uh, restriction in October of next year. There's a link back to it. It's a, a common enough flame retardant in thin PVC. We primarily see little boots. I don't know what you call those in the sleeves, boots at the PVC sleeve boots at the end of cables. Those things. That's where we see PIP. We see it not as commonly, but it does exist. So this is banned in the US and the EPA is very, very, very enforcement heavy. They literally have Google Map type things, all their enforcements of last year. Um, they're a little more intense and not as jovial about non-compliances. Um, so just make sure you guys do this one. Uh, we can help you with it. It's a very restrictive risk. Uh, we can definitely help you the PIP 3 and 1. Uh, Tosca PFAS. So this is not a restriction at this time. It's a data gathering exercise. So this only got published last week. You have to report your PFAS data in physical products and mixtures back to 2011. Um, if you're $120 million more in sales, it's May 8, 2025. If you're under $120 million sales, it's November 12, 2025. There are some other caveats, but they actually are pretty redundant with these two. These are really the two main ones. If you have a huge, huge tonnage and under $120 million sales, yes, you might be in. There's a tonnage round barrier too, but it's, it has to be the you know basically cheap plastic um, to meet that. Um, however, if you're FDA regulated, you don't have to do it. Medical devices, FDA regulated, don't have to do it. Pharmaceuticals, FDA regulated, don't have to do it. Food contact materials, FDA regulated, do not have to do it. But only the food contact materials, FDA regulated. The rest of the blender is not. So if you're using a Teflon food contact piece in the blender, out of scope. You use PTFE as the additive anti-drip agent in the ABS housing of the blender, it's in. Only the FDA regulated part is out, which is just the food contacting part, not the rest. The rest is not FDA regulated, only the food contacting part is. So um, what you have to report, by the way, you're not gonna remember this. Well, if you do, awesome. You're probably used to this reporting then. So, um, but the, everybody who registered received a copy of these slides and there's some more digestible versions of this in the next couple of pages. The, the whole system is originally written for chemical reporting. And it is actually identical pull downs of previous chemical reporting requirements. Um, and that's who it's built for. Just the difference is article manufacturers, physical product manufacturers are in scope this time, but the reporting system is still built for chemical people. So you don't report refrigerators, you report PTFE, report the chemical. And then how many units have that chemical? It's a little bit different. It's not like, hey, I have refrigerators and they have this much of each PFAS. 
Nope. It's like you have PTFE and then how many different products do you have to have it? And what's the maximum concentration in those products? And what are you using it for? And what are you using it for is in a free form. It is literally pulled down my news. So for PTFE, imagine you have refrigerators and amongst them we have PTFE, which you will. Then you report polytetrafluoroethylene. You don't report the refrigerator. You report polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE. Cast number for PTFE is normally 9002, but there are other options. Import volume, or if you make it yourself, your manufacturer volume of refrigerators, a number of units containing PTFE. If you have 100 refrigerators, you sell, and 100 remote controls, you sell. And they both have PTFE, and the maximum concentration, it's under 0.1% of the refrigerator, but it's above 0.1% of the remotes. You report the maximum concentration over 0.1% of the remote, and you report the 100 units plus 100 units, which is 200. So you're not doing component levels, you're doing it at a physical product level. It's the number of units. You can do kilograms or tons if you wish of PTFE, but you can do the number of units containing PTFE. Not the most useful thing I've seen. Then you have to do what industrial sector to pull down you are, what product category you are, and you have to do your functional uses. And it's a in deal with multi, I'll explain that. And when using PTFE, how much is for insulator? How much is for friction resistance? How much is for dielectric, et cetera? Um, percentage wise and adding up to 100%. Is, it is your product consumer or commercial? Is it intended for children? And what's the maximum concentration of the product? And they're based on basically SDS type rules. Under 0.1%, 0.1 to 1, 1 to 10, 10 to 30%, and 30 to 100%, which is pretty broad categories. Most gross physical products is going to be under 0.1% or between 0.1 and 1. So when we actually test products, we usually test a representative product or product family, and it creates the entire structure for it. But we do it first at the component level, so you know for Maine and Minnesota, you can roll the data up for that. You can also roll the data up for the US EPA. As the PFAS restrictions appear in Europe, they'll have derogations or exemptions. Individual columns we report will have different derogations. It makes it a lot easier to use for every category. PFAS testing, comparable testing, is just so much faster, cheaper, easier. And since a lot of the reporting is based on best knowledge, you often do re representative products and then just map that out. So when we do the testing, we create a uh, setup for each um, component. And by the way, we've done some of your components in the past and you don't have some of the EPA uh, listings, feel free to reach out. We can just add it to it. We have the information. We just didn't have the EPA listings necessarily when we did the testing, but the data is perfectly fine and we just have to add the EPA listings to it. And then if you need it, we can integrate it up for state level or US EPA. The US EPA, as I mentioned, is per chemical. So basically how many units you sell, uh, is it commercial or, or consumer, is intended for children, and then here's your PTFE information. We have polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, this cast number. Maximum concentration of the product happens to be 0.1 to 1%. It's a U-use operation because of an article. Our industry sector is IS42, and we can help you with that. Machinery, mechanicals, in this case, CC219. And then you have to break up the functions. So say half of them are used as wire or dielectric insulators, which we'll know from the previous data, say 50%. Uh, Anti-drip is a flame retardant, 25% friction uh, resistance for PTFE as bearings are similar, 24%, and then mold releases so darn small, lubricating agents say 1%, adds up to 100%. And so you have to report the different uses by percentage. So 50% are PTFEs and insulator, 25% flame retardants, 24% um, friction resistance, which strangely enough doesn't have its own category, and 1% and lubricating agent. And then you do the same thing with fluoroelastomer. And she, assuming you're using all your FKM, fluoroelastomer is a seal, it's basically as a sealant or barrier. There are other uses of fluoroelastomers, but um, you just break that up. And so we can easily integrate that for you when you have to do uh, FDA report, uh, EPA reporting or have to do state level or you're going, hey, uh, we have these new derogations appearing in uh, EU, which situation does it apply to? We can use the previous data. It's really, really good. Uh, you can make life difficult for yourself, but this is just simpler. Um, so what we normally do in our, in our 2024 and 2023 testing campaigns is we take a representative product, we do the PFAS testing, so you get the reportable information, you'll get the base level component data, and then it's relatively straightforward to roll up in state or federal. Um, then we also normally test for PFOA at the same time, and family, which are banned in the EU, and, and soon enough in Canada, but in the EU. Um, and the way it works in the EU is the punishment is related to two factors. A, did you not do the work you're supposed to? And B, how much poison did you release into people uh, or the environment? So the nice thing about uh, 
testing is it shows you don't know work. A data gathering from suppliers doesn't work for due diligence in Europe because they're used to dollar stores. So that's where a lot of enforcement comes from. Their supplier always says it's good. It means nothing. They look literally against your volume of sales. Did you do the testing? So it's critical for any due diligence, you have to have testing because in any enforcement. By the way, if whatever you've done, whether it's data gathering or put on a tutu and done circles and point at the sky and your product doesn't have PFOA, it's fine. It doesn't matter how you do it. But if you make a mistake, your supplier makes mistakes, all that matters is if you test it up. That's the way it is. Um, so your supplier data gathering, if you're using it, prevents you from having it, which is very, very rare in PFOA because it's mostly degrading. It's not added. Uh, it doesn't matter how you do it. But if you get into enforcement activity, all that matters is you test. That's all. So you want to test something represented to show you've done the work. If you've done the work, but still somebody made a mistake and you got PFOA, then the other part of the penalty is how much PFOA. It's 100 parts per billion. There's no penalty for that. So just make sure you test some representative parts and you have it. And particularly if you're a medical device manufacturer, you're not testing for PFOA, you're just wide open. Um, you can ask, you know, some of the, the other medical device chemical mistakes in the last couple of years are billions. Don't make that mistake <laughs> this trivial amount of testing costs. Um, and then we, we take and we build it in state or federal PFAS declarations and then look at the EU restrictions today and tomorrow, I'll give you all the answers. So it's really, really easy. It's weeks, not months or years. And it's very, very comprehensive. So again, uh, we can consolidate up to the EPA level. It's not that hard for us. So we really organize. So once we have the data, we consolidate. And the way you do, hey, I report back to 2011. Well, unless you have a major, major change, like you were selling cookware until 2014. Now you aren't. Okay, well, they're very different. Um, if you're tell selling roughly the same products, you create the template to declare. And then you, what you change for each year is the number of units. So base, this is the best estimate of what we have for PTFE, fluoroelastomer, uh, perfluoroelastomer, PVDF, et cetera. And this year we sold 124,000 units, the previous year 114 and so on and so forth. And what you report each year that changes is the number of units, not, because if you haven't changed your materials respect, specs related to perfluoros, uh, PFAS in the last decade, it doesn't really make a difference. So you just change the number of units, unless you had product lines that you don't have anymore, then you might have to make some other work. Now we do a lot of testing campaigns. One is PFAS, the other one, and so a big one right now is when in doubt, run to the PFAS, we can solve it. So it's just test some representative products, do the PFOA testing to prove you don't have any or do, which is actually common, and then work with you on how to solve it. Um, and then build the state or federal PFAS declarations or understand the restriction potential including Prop 65. For anybody who's tested before, we have a we have a campaign for 2024. We can update your previously tested products because the way we store data is really, really useful for us. So what we do is we'd update the PFAS reportable restricted, SVH, the new SVHCs like melamine, tetrabroma phthalates everywhere, tetrabroma TBBPAs everywhere, PIP, uh, PFHXS, which is pretty easy, it's not there, uh, MCCPs, formaldehyde, emissions based on mostly on historic data and then a handful of, of, of representative testing some because of our previous data we know we don't know if this particular part has melamine but it's the one that could so let's just test that part for melamine. Um, and then we update with a memo attaches your test report with new data says this is what your compliance is now and then give you an output which has all the rev control of what regulations you're up to speed with and this gets you up to speed where you need to be now so we have one every year the 2024 one is, is basically this one uh, 2025 will be some a different list of chemicals, but it's basically we create a structure where if we tested stuff for you before, we can update it without having to redo it from scratch. It's really good. So again, lots of new restrictions, uh, lots in Europe, even in the US now, um, and we can definitely help. We used to do data gathering, but once we got testing, we realized that data gathering and the actual what's in the product didn't match, and it created a huge quality and um, um, honesty conundrum. So we, we do do data gathering on very specific parts where the, like inside a battery, where it's quite exothermic to come in and the battery manufacturer, for the most part, PFAS is not quite true. I uh, know it's in there. Um, There's a lot we can do there. Um, but because of all the testing we've done and probably one of the highest volume labs in North America is we learn very quickly that our data gathering and what's actually in the product aren't that related. So um, it created a huge conundrum. We know if we're doing data gathering, the results aren't true, and that's a non-starter for us. At the end of the day, they, and when they, we got into enforcement actions many, many times, and yeah, yeah, we have supplier data. Supplier said it's good, and like they don't care. They really, really don't care. 
If if supplier data helped you be compliant, awesome. But if you get an enforcement action, they don't care. It could be the US, it could be Canada, it could be Europe, they don't care. It could be it could be Prophecy Vibe, they don't care unless you test it. That's all that matters. Um, it could be the EPA, it could be FDA, it could be uh, Environment Canada, it could be any of the EU. It doesn't matter if you're in enforcement action. All that matters is you test it. If you haven't tested, they don't care. So um, again, if you're compliant by wearing a tutu and spinning around until you fall down and your product ends up being compliant, that's fine. Um, it doesn't matter how you got there, but if you do have a non-compliance, all that matters is you test it. So perfect, I'm gonna look for questions. Feel free to submit as quite any questions you want. Uh, Oh, that's a good question. Can you confirm the microplastics amendment only applies to substances and mixtures? So products such as microfiber textiles do not apply. If they don't apply to a restrictions. We're having an interesting debate whether they apply to the declaration side. It looks like not, but that's an interesting thing. So it's so new, uh, we are reviewing it, but it's if it's embedded permanently and doesn't come out, it's definitely not in the restriction. But for the most part, it says actually mixtures, not articles. So if it doesn't say articles, it's not physical products. It's only uh, mixtures. And so most of them just say mixtures. They don't use the word article. There's also a comment about if it's permanently embedded, it's also out. Is Teflon in epoxy and scope for microplastics and mixtures banned? Um, not the ban. Well, if it's not consumer, no. If it's professional, there's a declaration requirement. So uh, like the super lube we use, name brand actually, it sounds like it's just like, but it's name brand. It's basically silicone or mineral oil, depending on which lubricant, with PTFE powder in it. Those are like the microplastics. However, it's a professional application, so they'd have to declare it to the customer, and then the customer would have to, the users, depending who they are, uh, would likely have to report to ECA every year. But as long as it's professional, it's not banned. If you have Teflon and epoxy, and you're selling the epoxy to consumers, you're likely going to have some sort of restriction. But if the, you're selling the Teflon impregnated epoxy to a manufacturing facility or a coder, they're professional and it's just reporting requirements. I've heard that PFOA was often replaced with Gen X. Gen X band? Uh, not yet. Um, it could be. Um, it does degrade into other substances we'd likely see. Um, there are other options. So right now, no, the EU PFAS restriction in absence of some other declaration, it will be, but there's a lot of consultation that still has to occur in the EU. So we're not sure which way Gen X will go. That's a really good question. It's, it's structurally a little different. Of course, you try to search Gen X right now, you get a very different word. So, um, what makes Gen X, it's an ether, and it's basically PFOA, more or less, where you put an oxygen in the middle. So the side pieces are really small, and it only degrades into tiny little things, like C2s, which most people don't even test for. So it would basically be invisible to testing. So it's not banned right now. It could be banned in the PFAS restriction in the future, but we don't see it right now. And it's pretty hard to see, actually. Perfect. Um, I'm a little bit over time. If I missed out any questions, feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to help. And uh, again, everybody register, receive a copy of the slides and we should see, I hope we talk to you soon. There should be a recording available from us in the next day or two. And um, if you need help, especially on the testing side, which is by far the best way to do it. If PFOA is, you make a mistake there, the amount of money involved in those lawsuits, just don't make a mistake. Um, we're happy to help. Thanks, everybody, and talk to everyone again soon.